Hi, everyone, and welcome to 35 Years and Counting, a five-week program highlighting the 35 years of long-term raptor migration data that we've collected across Hawkwatch International's migration sites. We're so glad you've joined us for this opportunity to learn and celebrate together tonight. I'm Kirsten Elliott, and I'm the Development and Communications Director at Hawkwatch International. Tonight, you're in for a treat. We're taking a deep dive into raptor identification with raptor biologist and banding coordinator, Jesse Watson. We also are gonna have a special treat in store after the talk. So if you can, I encourage you to stay tuned until the end so you don't miss out on that. Tonight's program is brought to you for free thanks to the generosity of our presenting sponsor, UAMPS, as well as our other sponsors, Caddis Enterprises, NextEra Energy, Anzac Polish Law, Ruby Mountain, Rocky Mountain Power, Terracon, the Birds and Wine Group, Enyo Renewable Energy, and Tab Bank but there's still much more to do in the future of raptor conservation. If you appreciate tonight's program and are able, I hope you'll consider making a tax deductible donation at hawkwatch.org slash donate or by texting hawkwatch, all one word, to 56651. With all that said, I wanna thank you again for joining us tonight to celebrate 35 years of raptor research, education, and conservation. Jesse, thanks so much for being here tonight. I'm going to let you take it away. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Kristen. Let me share my screen. All right, can you see the full, full presentation now? We can. Great. All right, folks. Thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Um, hopefully some of you were able to join last Thursday when uh, Dave Oliar uh, talked about raptor ID with birds in flight and uh, why we why we count raptors on, on migration and um, what we do with those data and how those data, collecting those data helps conserve raptors. Um, some of you may have joined on Tuesday. We had a, a video about banding uh, and this is kind of a follow-up to that. Uh, we're going to talk about more Raptor ID in hand. We're going to kind of focus uh, specifically around the in-hand guide, um, which is a product we, we came out with in the last year, um, and really useful tool that we have at our migration sites. And so if you have that, that guide already, feel free to follow along. Um, there'll be some, some tidbits that you can, you can pick up from that. Um, and I actually have some... Uh, in the corners of some of my slides, I actually reference the pages that I'm pulling some of the material we're talking about from. Um, so feel free to ask questions and um, I think we'll get to those at the end and um, hopefully you learn a thing or two. All right, so again, we're gonna kind of use this, this text uh, talking about in-hand raptors and so the value of, of why we banned raptors um, hopefully was, was clear over the last, last talk on Tuesday. Um, and, and now we're gonna talk about what we can learn from having those raptors in the hand. Uh, so we're gonna use this guide again as a reference. Gonna touch on uh, some of the basics to begin with, um, how to actually document raptors in the hand properly um, and why it's important. And then move right on into um, some specifics and, and talk a little bit about molt and um, how you can, can get a better understanding in, of what you're looking at when you are banding birds. So first of all, more, more broadly, um, we want to establish why documenting raptors in the hand is important. Um, same, same rules apply in, in general as why it's important to uh, properly document what we see at a hawk watch with observation. Um, so birds are flying overhead at, at a hawk watch migration count, and obviously uh, understanding what you're looking at as far as um, species is the most important thing in, in that case, uh, but species age could be relevant if you're asking questions about, um, you know, management related questions about birds that are moving through the area in a specific area, uh, you, you would want to know those details and the same thing, same rules apply the birds in the hand. If, if you're going to be banding birds and studying birds, um, whether that's satellite telemetry or color banding or something like that, it's relevant to, to know 
extremely relevant to know exactly what you're looking at. What, what is the age of this bird? Is it a male or female? Um, and, and those answering those questions can have implications for um, management um, if, if you're looking at uh, managing a species. But at the most basic level, um, documenting birds properly is important for learning and teaching. Um, and so all of the individuals that are in this slideshow tonight obviously are, are an example of that. You know, these birds were documented properly and then they can be used here in this, this kind of um, forum, I guess, uh, to, to learn and, and teach folks. So it can be used from a lay person perspective or again, sharing information, uh, whether that's on the management level of a species uh, or you know, some sort of scientific publication. Um, and then lastly, I, I like to say that it's a privilege. Um, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to capture and band birds. And so it's my opinion that when we do that and we're putting a bird through that process, even though it can be brief or should be brief, um, it's still our responsibility as someone who's banding a bird uh, to properly document things and, and um, get the most information as we can um, in the littlest amount of time and do that safely. And so remembering that you know, a lot of work went into, a lot of time and effort went into uh, acquiring permits um, to, to be able to do the work that we do. And a lot of training and effort has gone into making sure we do it properly. And so, you know, being respectful of the birds is important and, and properly collecting all the information that, that you have um, when you do have that bird in hand. So, First things first, I, I always like to kind of throw myself under the bus right away um, and show some images here that uh, I've taken. And so I'm responsible for these, these photos. And, and these are examples that uh, I think are not great. I think they could be, could be improved. Um, and there's two things that go on when you're, when you're collecting images of birds in hand. Um, someone is holding the bird and someone is taking a photo. And it's my opinion that whoever's taking the photo, it's kind of their responsibility to, to kind of line things up and make sure everything looks good in the square and we'll get the most information out of that image. So just some examples here of, of things that could be improved. Um, I, I should also mention a lot of the species or most of the species that I have in this PowerPoint, I have the four letter species code in the in the bottom of the image. So RTHA, of course, is red-tailed hawk, rough-legged hawk, red-tailed hawk again, and American kestrel. Um, and that's that's kind of throughout this talk. Um, but yeah, this this bird on the top left is a red-tailed hawk. And uh, you can see a couple things going on. Firstly, this the secondary is out of out of place. And this is actually me holding this bird. So I should have noticed and, and my photographer should have noticed um, the secondary is out of place that, that kind of makes it difficult to see what's going on as far as the molt goes, which will become more relevant as we continue to go through these birds in, in the talk today. Um, I'm also covering the head. That's not that great. And the tail's cut off. And so, you know, there's some useful information that we can get from this image, but it could be better. Uh, this rough legged hawk on the right. Um, I was the one taking the photo. And so, you know, I can't remember if I didn't tell the person holding the bird that I was taking the photo and could have got lined up better. Um, you know, got a got a better angle. You can see the the tail's partially covered by the wing secondaries here. We've also got a bright jacket in the background, uh, and that that's my fault. I, I should have had the person holding the bird move to a different spot, clean those things up, and and get a nice square photo. Um, again, bottom left, uh, this this red-tailed hawk. Its its secondaries are covering the tail. You can't see much of the tail and also half of the tail is shadowed. So that could easily be fixed by either rotating or, or again, communicating with that person holding the bird. We've got one more American kestrel here. We just got a really poor angle. Um, the hold isn't great. The bird is all cockeyed. Um, you can kind of see the wing, but it could be spread out a little bit better so we could see all the primaries. And so things to improve on here. Um, one, one last example, this is a ferruginous hawk. Um, and this one's not too bad, uh, but you can see the horizon is, is clearly not level. Um, and so if you're ever going to publish an image like this in some sort of study or, or use this in some sort of professional communication, I would personally be uncomfortable with it because it's, it's, the bird is not held properly in, in as, as good as it should be. Also, the, 
the person holding that's kind of holding far out on the primaries. Ideally, it's a little more in on the wrist. And, and you can kind of see that these primaries are all uh, inconsistently spread out. Um, so thing, things to improve on here. So moving on to proper documentation of birds in the hand. And, and if you, again, if you're following along in the, the in-hand guide, uh, page three has a nice table or plate where you can kind of see proper documentation. And, and typically those things for proper documentation are the wings are out at kind of a nice 90 degree angle. Um, whether you're documenting just one wing or, or both wings in some case, you get the ventral and the dorsal side. Not much of the hand, the person that's holding the bird is, is blocking anything, which is ideal. A nice clean tail that's square on the bottom and a nice headshot here that's clearly showing um, the bird's, the bird's head and, and um, very clean. And so level horizons, uh, you try to minimize shadows. Uh, as you're taking photos like this, it's nice in my opinion to, to either be in complete sun or complete shade. Um, if you get kind of in the middle with kind of a dappled lighting, uh, things get pretty difficult and, and tough to pull out and, and understand what you're looking at. I, I probably prefer all shade if possible. Um, and you can always lighten the image if you need to. A clean and neutral background is important. You'll notice a lot of the images in the slideshow don't have consistent clean background, and that's that's okay. This is smaller stakes than than the first two bullets here, but it's nice to have a, a nice clean background in case you ever are going to make any comparisons across individuals. Uh, say you're going to compare plumage from two birds or two species, sorry, two individuals of a species. Um, you would want to have a consistent background so you could say, oh, you know, the plumage on this bird clearly differs from, from that bird. And that gets pretty tough if you have just a grass background or a tree background and that's changing depending on your angle. So we, we use a nice uh, kind of a trifold board from, from like Office Max or something like that, or you can actually build one from uh, like a fold out wood board and, and paint it gray or white. So that's what I would recommend. Again, a nice spread tail where you can see all the tail feathers really clean uh, and the bird is held properly. Um, that's important. So again, working, working with your, your person that, that is holding the bird as a photographer, um, those are the, the key, key ways to, to maximize getting proper documentation. And the cool thing is once, once you've achieved this and you've got this documentation, you know, this, this plate here, that was all done in a matter of maybe two minutes maximum. Um, and that bird is, is on its way quickly. So it doesn't really add any time to your processing. Um, and, and again, we have these images that are useful into the future. And, and really, again, this in hand guide is, is a, an example of that. Some of the images in it date all the way back into the 90s, um, but they're still useful. And, and um, those type of images can, can be useful for years to come if, if they're documented properly. So as we dive further into the specifics of what we're gonna talk about today, um, the anatomy or the bird to topography, if you will, um, is important. So same as birds in flight, when you think about um, characteristics like the patagials on a red-tailed hawk flying over or uh, carpal patches on a rough-legged hawk um, or upper, upper tail coverts on a northern harrier, things like those, or, or of course like the malar stripes on a falcon, those, those type of things are really useful. Um, and it's important to know those words and terms when you're communicating with someone, uh, whether that is a bird in flight or whether that's a bird that you have in the hand if you're trying to highlight something or, or focus in on something. So this is just kind of a reminder um, of those, those, those terms. Um, and again, you can find this in the in-hand guide pages four and five. And then the, the flight feathers. Um, that's a lot of what we're going to focus on today. Uh, so the flight feathers are, are made up of the rimages, singular remix, and the retrices or singular retrix. And the rimages are the primary secondies, secondaries and the tertials. And so those are the flight feathers uh, or the rimages, and we number them individually. Um, and that's very useful, especially when we talk about molt. Uh, because we will refer to an individual feather. And so labeling those uh, is, is really useful for us. So we've got a Swainson's hawk on the top. Uh, generally, these birds have 10 primary feathers. So we count from the outside, the outers will say, 
10987654321. And then we count the secondaries in towards the body. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, there's varying numbers of secondaries with these birds generally, especially with buoyos, it's around 13. And then there's several tertials that are uh, kind of the innermost feathers on the bird. And actually those inner more feathers are a lot more uh, faded generally. Um, and it can be confusing. They can look older, even though they may not be of a different age. Um, and they look older because they're catching a lot more sun. You imagine a bird has its wings folded and it's perching. Those are the outermost feathers as these feathers kind of fold over each other. So something to, to keep in mind. And then we've got the retrices. Um, these birds will have 12 in, in most cases. Uh, that's what the expected number of retrices is. And we, we count them from the outside, six, five, four, three, two, one. And the, the centers or the deck feathers are, are one. Uh, I like to, to count um, by starting on the outside of both sides. So kind of like a deck of cards, I, I grab the outermost retrices. If, if someone is holding the bird and I count inwards. And I like doing that because if there happens to be one missing, you'll clearly see that one doesn't match up. Um, and you'll be able to find that versus if you simply just counted from the right side, say, and there was a retrix missing, you might miss that if you don't have one to match up to. And so that's, that's a good approach, I think, is, is counting them um, at the same time, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. So, as you're working with birds in the hand, and of course the same applies with birds in flight, it's important to know the aging terminology. And it's important to know that terminology so you can, uh, again, communicate with, with folks that you're working with or understand what you're looking at. So at the most basic level, um, we have age broke down in our in-hand guide by plumage-based Age, age class is, is the term that we use. Um, and I should, I should state that uh, different age aging systems or terminology are used depending on the vendor, depending on actually species groups and, and certainly regionally people will use or researchers will use different age terminology. In this guide, uh, we use two different aging terminologies. Um, so I'll use those throughout. And the most basic one again is, is plumage based. Uh, age class. And, and the word plumage, if you're not familiar with that, is simply the collectively uh, the feathers that a bird has. And so at any one time, uh, a bird has a plumage. And so most of the species that we have, diurnal raptor species in North America, have two plumage-based age classes. And uh, this is a great example of that here. We've got a sharp shin hawk, two different sharp shin hawks, and they, they have they each are wearing, if you will, their own plumage-based age class. The one on the top is a juvenile. Uh, the one on the bottom is a adult. And so the important thing about plumage-based plumage -based age class is that it uh, is irrelevant um, to the, the human calendar that we use. And so the point is, this bird on top may have hatched, say, in, let's say, May. It came out with this juvenile plumage and it lives for the whole year. Um, so if you're tracking on a calendar here, it lives past December into January. Um, and then it starts to molt and say, let's say May again, it begins to molt. It's technically still a juvenile. It's in juvenile plumage or juvenile plumage based age class. But it's going to start replacing those feathers with adult feathers like this bird below. So then it's in its second plumage based age class, adult. And if it continues to live and continues to molt each year, which it will, uh, it's going to look, it's going to fall into this adult age class. And that won't change. The feathers will change, but the, the look of the feathers is going to stay pretty consistent and it's going to look different than this juvenile. So that, again, at the most basic level is the plumage-based age class. But, um, and I will, I will point out, actually, before I move on, um, Two plumage-based age classes here with, with most species. So certainly excipiters, um, budio species in general have two plumage-based age classes. Um, the falcons do as well, though there are some species like 
the white-tailed hawk um, or the Swainson's hawk, a, a, a Budio species, and golden eagles or eagles in general that have three plumage-based age classes. And so they actually go from juvenile to subadult to adult. So not everything falls under these two categories here, um, but, but the general rules apply, so you can kind of keep that in mind. But as, as banders or people that have birds in hand, we break things down further. And so if we're banding birds and we're gonna submit those records to the banding lab, which we're required to do as banders, uh, we wanna have a more exact or specific age. And so we actually do factor in uh, the calendar or the human, human made calendar um, into those ages. So if you look in our guide, every, every plate um, or every picture that is referring to a specific bird is typically gonna have two age classes. And it's gonna say HY slash SY. And what that means is, again, if we had this bird that's in juvenile based, uh, juvenile plumage based age class, it, it hatches say in 2021, this, which this bird in this picture did. This was this year, this bird hatched. Let's hope that bird survives till next year. As soon as it lives to January 1st, as far as banding age goes, even though it's still in juvenile plumage, we would now refer to that bird as a second year as far as banding or BBL age code. And again, BBL is just bird banding lab. Um, then the bird is going to molt. It's technically still a second year based on the calendar. And then the calendar changes and it becomes a third year. And so this gets a little bit complicated if you really dive into it. But the point being, remember that there's two plumage based age classes. And depending on the season when you capture a bird, it may have a different bird bending lab age code. So that leads us to molt and uh, talking about why it occurs and why it's relevant to us, especially as far as aging and identified birds in the hand goes. Uh, simply, feathers are, are dead structures. And so over time they wear, just like, just like your skin, um, just like the clothing that you wear, it's the same idea and they need to be replaced. And these birds, raptors will, will in most cases, um, have a new set of feathers every year. So they may, not, they may not replace every one of their feathers, uh, but they, they will work on replacing some of those over time. And so molting is the replacing of old and worn feathers to make way for new growth. And there's also um, intra or interspecies interactions and in, in whatnot that can be affected by uh, replacing feathers and molt. So obviously if you're a juvenile, um, you may be treated more differently or differently than, than an adult, say if you fly into someone's territory. Um, if you're a hatch year uh, or juvenile sharpshin hawk and next year you molt into an adult plumage, if you're back on someone else's territory with adult plumage, the interaction you have with that adult may be different than you would have as a juvenile. And so there's, there actually are, again, inter or intra species um, interactions that, that have kind of a bio, biological um, component to them and relevance. Uh, molting is energetically costly, which is partly why you don't see these birds molting more often because it, it takes and more often as in more than once in a season or a year because it takes a lot of energy and energy resources to, to rebuild those feathers and, and grow them. And so um, it also depends on the, uh, the timing, the timing of molt depends on your location. So birds in the south, uh, where it's not as cold, um, it's a lot easier for them to begin molting early and they will often replace all of their feathers in a single molt versus a, a bird that is further north, say up in the Yukon or Alaska, uh, the, the breeding season is shorter. So they have uh, less time to replace their feathers, which, which may result in them replacing fewer feathers and thus retaining more feathers each time um, they molt and retaining is simply just like it sounds they they don't replace a given feather in a, in a molt season and they retain it for one more season until next year and then the molt starts with that feather um, and we'll, we'll go on into that next uh, and the other point about uh, molt being energetically costly often it, it doesn't coincide um, with other energetically costly uh, activities in a bird's life. So whether that may be or migration um, or breeding, 
Now, it's not to say that a bird cannot be molting during those periods of time, um, but often um, they may suspend molt if they start migrating and then finish it after the fact or get all their molting done before they breed. And of course that gets further complicated by the latitude of where they're nesting. Again, a, a more Northern bird and a bigger bird is likely to, to have a shorter breeding season um, up in the North and, and also because of that, be able to replace fewer feathers overall. Okay, so there's a background on, on molt and then now kind of getting into the actual utility of molt and why it's relevant for us. Um, we can look at the pattern that these feathers are replaced in and that can help us give an understanding or get an understanding of how old that bird may be, which again may have uh, consequences as far as management or biological consequences for that individual bird. And we wanna understand those. So we have two species groups that we're focusing on, uh, Excipitridae, which includes uh, the eagles, the Budio species, um, Northern Harrier, that type of thing. Uh, and then Falconidae, which includes all the falcons. So peregrine falcon, Merlin, American kestrel, prairie falcon, cheer falcon. And the reason that those things are split up is because those, those individual species groups molt differently. Their sequence is not the same. And that's very relevant for us if we're gonna look at a bird and dissect it, uh, dissect the molt that is, and, and try to understand what's going on. So on, on top here, we have a Northern goshawk bottom we have an American kestrel. And I should say that both of these birds here are known juveniles. Um, so that, that's a good starting point. And um, I should say known juvenile plumage that they're, they're wearing. So this is the first time they've molted or we'll call it the second pre-basic molt, which is the technical term for what's going on. So birds in the family Excipitridae, uh, they begin their molt at P1 and P2. You think back to the, the uh, the numbering of the feathers that we talked about. These are the innermost primaries here. And again, they have 10 primaries. So both, both uh, fal falcons and um, birds in Excipitridae have 10 primaries. And the northern goshawk and the other birds in this family, they begin molting at P1, and they molt outwards towards their outer primaries. And you can follow along on page nine if you have the guide, but P1 you can see is just starting to come through here. And actually it's, it's all, it's about three quarters of the way in, but P2 up here is, is just starting to come in. So that's the second one in the sequence. This one will drop next P3. It'll get replaced and it'll go all the way around. And the secondaries at the same time will begin uh, molting as well. And we'll talk about those next, but it's important to realize of course that these birds can't replace all of their feathers at once. And that's, that's why there's a sequence. Obviously, if, if all of the birds' feathers fell out, uh, it wouldn't be able to fly and, and, and uh, continue living. So that's, that's why there's a sequence um, that mold follows. So for the falcons, um, their sequence is a little bit different. They begin around P4 and P5, and then they molt towards the outers. So P5 towards P10 and P4 or 5 towards the inners, we'll call them, uh, so P1. So notice how that sequence differs. And so you can see the first two, just, just as we'd expect, are P4 and 5. And a nice thing to point out here is often these, these cupboards, um, they will match or they should match uh, as being new feathers when those primary feathers are being replaced. Same goes with the secondaries. The, so these are cupboards here. The term is, is a cupboard or, or a feather that basically covers the base of these primaries and secondaries. It's kind of like a shingle if you think about a roof. Um, if you were to remove these or move them out of the way, you would see the base of these, the quill from these feathers going into the wing. So now let's, let's talk about uh, secondary molt. So we've got the primaries molting as we talked about going in the sequence with, with the family Excipitridae. day. Um, Simultaneously, we have molt beginning at these molt centers, and that's a term that we'll use um, that's, that's relevant. And the molt centers uh, in the secondaries are S1, S5, and S13, and you can see the directions that they'll begin molting. So those, the, the, the molt centers, that simply means that that is, that feather, S1, S5, and S13 is the expected feather 
that will start with the secondary molt and then they'll move in those directions again simultaneously with, with the primaries molting. And with falcons, um, the molt centers are a little bit different. Also P5 here going, sorry, S5 going this direction, but you notice the difference here that S5 also goes towards the, the lower number of secondaries or S1. Um, and so a little bit different direction, but same, same idea applies. So now that we, we understand that there's a sequence that you would expect these feathers to be replaced in during molt, we can apply the, the knowledge that we've gained um, and, and use that to better understand how to age a bird if you have it in hand. And so we call this aging by wing molt. Um, and there are limitations. You, you can't necessarily pin down the age of every bird that you're looking at. Um, you can hopefully at least get to, at the most basic level, you can call the bird a juvenile. Uh, and then the, the level beyond that would be calling it an after hatchier bird, which would mean it's an adult, but we don't specifically know how old it is. And if you, if you dive deeper, you, you could potentially call it an after second year or an after third year, uh, something like that. And so it, it gets more and more difficult to do that as the bird gets older and older, because there's a lot more different age feathers and the sequence gets very confusing. So what we're gonna stop pretty much after second year, um, but I think you'll get the point. So aging by wing molt, um, adults with retained juvenile feathers. So knowing the sequence that this bird molts and this is a rough legged hawk, we can count backwards again. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We know based on where this sh bird should begin at a molt center, um, we know that P1 should have been the first to, to replace. And it went out this way. And it actually stopped here. You can see that this is a pretty dark P8. Um, and P9 and P10 are lighter. P10 should have been the last one to replace in the primaries if the bird molted all the way through. Um, you notice that P8 looks pretty dark, and that, that doesn't mean it's a different age than these secondary or primaries before it. It's probably darker because if you think about it, this feather grew in last, knowing it didn't go to P9 and 10. These are retained juvenile feathers. So P8 was the last adult or second year feather to grow in, and it's really dark because it's, it's had less sun exposure over time than these feathers that, that grew in first. So that's, that's good to keep in mind. Remember also, I talked about the, the coverts and they can kind of match in, in tone and look the same age or are the same age often as, or they should be the same age as, as the feathers that they're covering, the flight feathers that they're covering. S4, if we know the sequence again, as far as the sequence that secondary should molt, and I'll go back a slide. Remember, uh, if we start here at S1, it should go one, two, three, four, and eight actually are often the last secondaries to be replaced. And that pretty much matches with what we see here. So we got one, two, three, four. Notice it's actually shorter, uh, which is something that's known in Budios typically um, that second year birds, their adult feathers are going to be longer than their, or their adult secondaries are going to be longer than their juvenile secondaries. So that's another key here. We've got a different tone in the feather. The banding and pattern doesn't really match these adult secondaries and it's shorter. Um, next year when this bird replaces its feathers again, um, the feather would be the same length at that point because it'd be an adult feather. And, and so that's important to, to keep track of. And another important thing here that is, is useful to know is next year, this bird will probably begin molting at P9 because it left off there. So this is a juvenile P9. It's going to drop that one. It's going to start molting there. It's going to do nine, then 10. And then it's actually going to come back to one and just start the sequence again. And it probably won't get this far next year. It'll probably get somewhere in like seven, maybe. And it, it's hard to know how far it'll actually get. But then you can see at that point, then these three would be retained. Um, and then you, you're starting to think about this bird is after second years or after two years old, how old is it? And that's where it gets fairly complicated, but possible.
to, to, to potentially age those birds. Same with S4, it's because that is the last juvenile secondary to be retained, that'll be the first one probably to molt out. And then it'll start up again at S1 and S5 and S13 uh, at those molt centers. And it's important to point out that these are just guidelines as far as the sequence that we expect these feathers to be replaced in. There's no guarantee that that is actually the, the uh, sequence that the birds are going to replace their feathers in, um, but, but it's what's most expected and most likely, especially giving, going from juvenile to their first adult plumage or second pre-basic molt. So on the bottom, we have a northern goshawk. Um, the interesting thing that we see here is all of these feathers look the same age. And if you're familiar with northern goshawks, this is clearly an adult goshawk. It's got gray, beautiful feathering. Um, and you can't see any retained juvenile feathers. So we know it's not a juvenile, of course. But because all the feathers that are here appear to be the same age, we would probably leave it as AHY, which means after hatch year simply meaning it's an adult, but we can't boil it down further than that. And that's, that's what we tell our banders to do. We don't want them to force an age. Um, we want them to take the safest approach, which is calling this bird, yeah, it's an adult after hatch year. Chances are it's probably a second year um, because it's, it's often likely, especially in Budios on top here, it's very likely if they do replace all of their feathers in their second pre-basic molt into adulthood, it's often, um, they will most likely do that as a second year. Um, beyond that, then they may start not getting all the way through, say their primaries or secondary, and, and they'll be they'll be uh, retaining more. So if you if you come across an, uh, a budio, especially that has replaced all of its feathers, it's one has one age of feathers, it's probably a second year bird, but safest to call it AHY as we've done with this goshawk. So wing molt is the most useful for aging these birds, um, but tail molt, molt is also relevant um, and, and really can complement wing molt. Um, certain species like the golden eagle in particular, the wing or the tail molt is, is very useful um, and, and probably actually the best way to age them. Um, but again, Accipitra day and Falcona day, the molt sequence or expected molt sequence is, is a little bit different um, with Budios, uh, or I should say Accipitra day, so eagles, Budios, uh, Northern Harrier, for example, this is what you would expect, um, the molt sequence progressing from R1, remember R1 is referring to retrix or retrici, R1 would be the deck feathers or the central tail feathers, then it would go six, four, three, two, five, if it followed the, the expected sequence, and I like this upper, this, this example on the upper left here, red-tailed hawk, clearly a second year bird, it retained at this point one juvenile retrici R5, and that matches our sequence because that should have been, if it followed this sequence, should have been the last tail feather to replace. So that makes sense. Uh, and likewise here, sometimes R2 or R3 are the, are the last um, tail feathers to be replaced. This rough legged hawk kind of demonstrates that here. Um, R2 is retained, you can see. Um, and, and clearly, um, it, it didn't follow this, this sequence with that logic, um, but, but it does follow this R2 or R3 being the last to be replaced. On bottom here, we've got a peregrine falcon tail. Um, their typical sequence progresses from R1 to R6, so they do their deck feathers, then their outer tail feathers, and then two to five, so they go back to two to three, and usually these are sequential and, and matched. So you would expect R2 on the left, R2 on the right, um, which we, we can't tell from here if that happened exactly in time, but it probably did because we see R4 and R5 on both sides retained at this point. And again, uh, R4 and R5 would be the last ones based on this expected sequence. So that makes sense. Um, but there are other sequences that can happen, especially adults, they may follow R1, two, six, three, four to five. So just, again, know, be aware that, that nothing uh, is always consistent and there's, there's variation uh, to expect. And, and don't be alarmed if you see that, just document it and think about it and, and take these photos to have those photos to send to other folks who, who may know more than you or who, who have better resources or, or have suggestions. Um, that would be my recommendation. Okay. 
So now we'll kind of break away from the the heavy look on on molt and just talk about some fun things that are in the in hand guide um, that are useful to to raptor banders and enthusiasts. Um, I just mentioned how not everything progresses as you would expect it to, and so there's a term called adventitious molt, um, and it's basically a phenomenon where hatch year or first year birds lose their flight feathers due to either trauma or partial molt. And so we've got some examples of that here. These birds, based on all the clues we see, should be in their juvenile plumage. Um, if you're familiar with red-tailed hawk, which both of these, this is the same bird front and back, um, it looks like a juvenile. But if you look close, especially from the top side, we can see that, well, it has some juvenile, a lot of juvenile secondaries, but it looks like P4, P6, 7. And again, it's, it's maybe a little hard to tell at this scale, but if you have the book, you can look a little closer. Uh, but also some tail feathers are replaced. Some are adult and some are juvenile. And those are out of sequence. You wouldn't expect a juvenile uh, in, in mainly juvenile plumage to have this weird sequence. Remember how we just learned how you would expect primaries to molt from one, two, three, four. Then it's strange if it's at four, four, six, and seven. So you know something's going on here. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of unknowns here. It, there's no real good explanation as to why this may occur, especially if it is um, quote unquote natural and not due to trauma, uh, but it, it can be seen and it can throw people off if you see this, this red-tailed hawk and you're like, why does that bird have adult feathers when it should be a juvenile? Um, it's, it's generally observed in the fall um, and often it seems, and anecdotally seems to, to occur further north populations you know, more often. At least that's what I've I've been told. I haven't seen it, but once or twice myself. Um, so just an interesting thing to, to keep keep an eye out for. Um, wanted to touch on American kestrels, specifically females. Um, there's been some thought over time that you could age American kestrel females by the thickness of their tail bands. And really what was used was a comparison uh, of the thickness of this subterminal band to the next band, the basal band or the adjacent band, if you want to call it that. There's tons of variation, which is pretty cool to see. Um, and the idea was if, if the, the subterminal band was a lot thicker than the adjacent band, then you would call the bird an adult. Um, and, and there was evidence that that wasn't the case um, years ago, but more and more, there's more and more evidence to show that that is, is certainly not the case. There's a lot of variation, meaning you, you can find juveniles that have a very thin subterminal band and a thin adjacent band, or you can find ones that have a thick subterminal band and a thin adjacent band, meaning you can't just grab an American kestrel and say, oh, based on this thickness of the band, it's, it's an adult. And actually all these birds that we have in hand here are juveniles. You can actually see some of the feathers are still in their sheaths. Um, there's also some thought that you can age the birds based on the shape of the tail feathers and the flight feathers, and, and that just also is not true. You can see these tails are pretty rounded. The idea is that maybe um, they'll be sharper pointed as juveniles, and then the adults will be more rounded, but these are all juvenile birds here again, and you can see all these secondaries are very rounded, and the tail feathers are very rounded. So really subjective, um, not something that should be used at all to, to age American kestrels. Kestrels are really tough and tricky. Um, so best case is, is to either, depending on the time of year that you catch that bird, best case is to, to call it probably a, an unknown age, um, unless you catch it in say February when you know a juvenile didn't come out of a, of a cavity, you know it's at least after hatch year. Um, the only really way you can age them is, is either, of course, by banding them as a juvenile when you know the age and then uh, observing or capturing that bird again at a later time um, when you can say, oh, now it's three years old because I caught it three years ago. Um, or you can look at the fault bars, which I'm not going to touch on, but you can compare fault bars and, and know that those feathers don't match because the, the faults are in different spots of the feather. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can, you can look at the in-hand guide and kind of understand what fault bars are. Um, another cool, cool thing is the Northern Harrier. Um, a lot of folks don't know that the deck feathers or the central tail feathers that we just learned about, um, they generally do not match the rest of the tail. 
a lot of folks will see those deck feathers, especially in a bird that's captured in hand. Um, and they're, they're analyzing it and looking at it and they say, oh, these, these deck feathers are of a different age. They don't match. So, you know, they're, they're new feathers or they're old feathers or whatever. But that's simply not true. It's just they look different and that's expected and all these feathers are the same age. Uh, so that's kind of a cool tidbit to, to latch onto and, and to have in your, your pocket or your sleeve if you're out looking at a harrier or you photograph one and you see that tail looks different. Um, kind of a cool little thing. Um, I'd like to put this slide in just because it's got a lot of cool different tails. Um, this is a good reminder that there's just so much variation out there in the world, uh, especially with raptors. Um, Red-tailed hawk, of course, are a good example of that. There's just tons of variation between individuals, uh, both juveniles and adults here. And these are of the Harlands, subspecies of red-tailed hawk, um, but no two birds are the same, which is, which is fun and makes things tricky. Um, so remember to not be overconfident. Know that things may not look like what you expect them to look like. Um, and there's, there's always a lot of variation. So uh, I'll try to breeze through this pretty quickly, but I have a few examples here that are, that are kind of useful and apply some of the logic that, that I've used as we've gone through and talked about some of these birds. Thanks to uh, Neil Paprocki for sharing some of these photos. Um, but I just want to go through the process that I would go through if I had this bird in hand um, to try to get to aging and sexing this bird. Um, first off, I'll, I'll tell you that it's um, a female. So you would know that based on the morphometrics uh, as you ban the bird, that would be pretty clear. Like, okay, this is a female. But my process, if somebody sent me this photo would be to, to count down from the primaries, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, Secondary starting here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I would I would do that and make sure it's not missing any feathers. And then I would start to look and see if there's any any differences um, between the feathers that we're looking at. To me, it looks like all the primaries look very similar, but I see these first two secondaries look like they have a different tone. And I'll go back right here. These secondaries are different different tone than the rest of these. And if we think back to the molt sequence, we know that um, these are retained. And if, if we talk about, uh, if we talked about where um, secondary molt starts at four and five and it works inward. So these would be the expected probably last secondaries to replace. So we know this bird is at least after hatch year because it's got two different ages of, of secondaries here. If you look closer, you can see that there's Looks like there's some different colored body contour feathers on the back. So again, additional ages or multiple ages of feathers. Uh, chances are this bird probably is after second year. Um, seems like those retained body feathers also kind of have this bluish sheen, which is kind of a characteristic of an adult Merlin. Uh, but safest bet would be to call this bird an after hatch year. This is out of the guide um, in the Northern Gossock section. And, and I like this example because it's, it's a good one showing that uh, documentation of these birds can still be useful years down the road. And this is from Jerry Liguori. Um, years and years ago, I don't know what year this is from, but clearly an old photo. Um, but but the, use, the utility of it is, is, doesn't lie. It's pretty obvious that this can be useful for us. So again, if you know a Northern Gossock, um, you know that this bird is, is an adult, but it does, as you can see, retain some juvenile plumage. And you can see that with kind of the brown, brownish feathers that are poking through. Think about the sequence again. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I think there's actually a primary missing. There's one broken off right there. We know the secondary start here. Notice the change in the shape of the feather clearly a secondary versus a primary. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we've got two retained secondaries here, flight feathers, rimages. Um, and the cool thing with Gossock, unlike the Budios, is these hatch year uh, secondaries are actually longer in most cases. Same with um, eagles. They're actually longer than you would expect the secondaries in the adult to be. So you can see they're, they, they're longer and there's actually some more banding barring uh, than these adult feathers that have replaced. And so clearly a second year bird. And you can also see uh, retained 
uh, hatch your upper wing coverts and, and some body feathers here that, that were retained from when this bird was a juvenile just a year ago. Another example um, of a, uh, a red-tailed hawk. Um, this is a really useful example because you can see we start here at 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You notice these three outer primaries, which should be the last ones to replace based on what our knowledge of molt sequence, they're retained. They're a different age. When we go into the secondaries, one, two, three is right here, and four is here, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, so we can see, again, the sequence followed what we had expected it to. S4 and S8 would be the last ones to replace, and sure enough, they're retained juvenile feathers. They're shorter, unlike the goshawk. Uh, again, um, in, in Budios, that they should be shorter as juvenile. You can actually see it's a little tough, but you can see the thickness of the subterminal band, which we probably talked about or Dave talked about in the in-flight ID. You can see the thickness of that band is not matching the adjacent secondary S5. Um, so in flight, you could probably see that if the bird's wings were spread and you got a nice photo of it. Uh, but again, nice example of a second year bird. And uh, we'll just wrap up here. I think I have two slides left. Um, my, my point here is, and I'm not gonna dive into the specifics, but there's a lot more to look at than what we've looked at. Um, this is a wing of a rough-legged hawk and there's a lot a lot of different ages and blocks of feathers here showing that this bird is clearly beyond second year. And so just kind of a, a reminder to, to, to look closely and know that there's more going on um, than meets the eye and, and know your limitations. Don't, don't jump out and say, you know, I think this is a third year bird for sure and this is why, you know, talk to someone else who may know more than you, use resources like the in-hand guide, um, and, and if you're not comfortable pinning down the age specifically, you probably want to call the bird an after hatch year. So this bird might be an after third year uh, based on, again, um, it's got a new, what looks like a new P2 and three. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So it looks like one might be retained. Two and three might be uh, new, then we go four, five, six, seven, eight, looks like it's new, different tone. And, and I understand that this can be challenging in photos. Um, nine looks like it's retained and, and 10 looks like it's new. So with that knowledge and everything we talked about sequence wise, we can tell that, um, again, this is probably beyond a second year bird. And, and we do have some more resources in the guide that can help you try to get beyond those ages of, of just hatch year and second year. This is just the front side of that same bird. Kind of gives you a different perspective and you can see again, the different color and tone of each of the feathers. So with that, I think we're pretty much on time and I will wrap up and take any questions. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jesse. I know that that was a really deep dive. So I hope that's what all of you were here for. Um, I know that some folks were having trouble following along. It didn't appear that we had pointer abilities through a little bit of that. Sorry about oh, that, sure. Jesse. So um, we might want to flip through some of those uh, photos again. So if you have questions and want to see an image again, we're happy to take some time and do that. Um, before we jump into the questions, though, I just want to thank you all again for joining us and thank our sponsors for making this possible. Um, but I did promise that we would have a special offer for our, those of you who stuck around the whole time. So if you want an in-hand guide but do not have one yet, or if you want another one to give to a friend or something, um, we are going to offer 15% off the in-hand guides tonight only. So I'm going to put a link in the chat right now. And if you use code 35 years, you'll receive 15% off and we'll get those out right away. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks to our sponsors. And now let's take a few questions. So Jesse, Connor mm -hmm. wanted to know about the sharp chin hot photos at the very beginning of the presentation. Um, and so Connor was asking about the juvenile outer primaries. Um, he said that they look shorter than the adult plumage and wanted to know if this was normal for recipitors or if it was just the hand placement. Uh, yeah, let me 
Let me share my screen again. Sorry about the uh, pointer. I realized that I should have been over on this screen. Can you see my? We can see your pointer now. Yep. Oh, it's gone. Just a sec. Let's try this again. So is this, I don't know, this is not the right one. I believe this it was this, yes, this was when it came through. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I I think it's probably just a relic of how the bird is being held. Um, there's no, there should be no reason that these primaries would be any different length. Um, so that's that's the quick, quick answer. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Connor, if you have a follow-up, please let us know. And um, we do have a few minutes for questions. So if you have any burning questions, please use the Q&A or the chat feature to make sure that we get to them. Elizabeth asks, is there any suspicion as to why after hatch year birds replace all their feathers more commonly? Is it because they don't have the stress of nesting? Um, so I'll rephrase what I said earlier just to make sure that I'm addressing the question properly. So it would be more likely that a bird that's going from juvenile plumage into adulthood, so second prim basic molt, would replace all of their feathers. And I'm not sure if that's what Lizzie's saying or not. Um, because, yeah, uh, part of it could be because the bird hasn't bred yet, so it didn't have that stress. Um, Again, but it, it can factor in like how far north the bird was, um, how maybe food stress the individual was. But as, yeah, that bird has more and more responsibility as far as migrating at a certain time because it needs to get back or forth to return to the nest site, or it's got a really far migration all the way north, it's up in Alaska. Those things as the bird ages um, will result in the sequence maybe not being completed, which will mean it has more retained feathers um, and so as an after hatch year or after second year, you would get more and more complicated and more, more or less likely that all the feathers would be, be replaced. I don't know if that answers the question. Probably confusing. Elizabeth <laughs> says yes and thank you. So, so great. Um, Perfect. Well, we have one more question in the chat. Um, I will just mention again that if you are joining for free tonight, thanks to all of our fantastic sponsors, but you want to support things like the creation of this in-hand guide and long-term monitoring at our raptor migration sites, you can make a tax-deductible donation at hawkwatch.org slash donate, and your gift will be matched dollar for dollar up to $50,000. So next question is from Connor. Is it possible to recognize a sealed follicle from a pinched feather on birds in the hand um, or how to document gaps in a bird's wing slash feather? Interesting question. Yeah, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the specifics of like a sealed follicle or a pinched. Um, I don't know if that's specific to like maybe more rehab work or more um, falconry stuff. Um, I, I just maybe don't have the knowledge of, of having done that, but I think you could certainly recognize. Could you say the second part of the question? Yeah, so the second part of the question was about how to document gaps in a bird's wing or feather. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're documenting this, like you, you saw what you've described, I think the best way to document it would be to have a nice spread photo, wing spread photo. Um, and then even like labeling individual feathers, like, cause it can be very difficult if you can't see that a feather is beginning to grow out. As you look at these pictures, it can be pretty tough to say, oh, is S, is S5 there or is P6 there? And so you could, you could write a note and that's what I would do and say, to kind of accompany your photo and say, hey, S, S4 or five was coming in, it's just like, just coming out of the wing. Um, that's what I would do. Great. Rebecca wants to know if any of the species that we're sharing here, or I would assume that kind of applies to the whole in-hand guide, have alternate molts and then basic molts in the same year. Um, all these birds go through a second or through a pre-basic molt each, each year. So you would expect that like in the spring, uh, 
American kestrel, particularly males, are an interesting one because they, in their first season, will molt their body plumage. Um, so they'll come out of the nest with pretty like streaked breasts, but come late fall, their breasts will look more like an adult because they've, they've got more spotting and, and whatnot. So that, that's an example of um, an individual species that does have a little bit of different mold going on. Uh, Mississippi kites also have something similar, uh, which Mississippi kites are not in our guide at this point. Um, but the expected typical molt would be a pre, one of these pre-basic molts um, starting sometime in the spring, wrapping up in the fall. Great. Just had a, another question come in, this time from Jean. Jean would like to know if there's any benefit in using a measured grid, say a one inch grid as a background for photos. And do we know of anyone who does this? Sure, I think there could be some utility to that. Uh, the challenge of course is like being consistent with where you're measuring the bird from, uh, which can vary quite a bit. It, it, I would feel better about it if it was you or myself doing the same thing every time. If I told five people to go use this grid on a bird, I'd probably get five different measurements. But if I did it five times with five different birds, maybe at least I'd be starting at the same point. So if you had a, a specific question that could be answered with using a grid like that, I feel like it'd be useful, whether that's looking at like juveniles and trying to figure out um, at what rates, you know, P7 grows in or something like that at, you know, five days old, you measure it at seven days old, you measure it at nine days old. Um, but keep in mind, like if you're just simply going for documentation, like you're you're trying to not have a lot of distractions and, and it can certainly become distracting if you have a grid in the background. So not a bad idea at all, um, but it, it would be the, the important question to ask first is, is why you're doing it and what you're trying to document. Great. Um, I had another question come through and I'm not sure, I think I know what the person is, is asking. Um, but I'm not sure. So they were asking, how do we help documenting? I'm assuming that's referring to how can you play a role in this, um, which is probably a good thing to touch on quickly. Sure, yeah. I mean, my plea, so as I talked about, is, is like I've taken a lot, of bird, a lot of photos of birds in hand, and I've taken a lot of bad photos that, I, that really make me cringe. I look back and like I handled for my master's research, 80 adult ferruginous hawks, dark morphs, light morphs, um, pretty privileged opportunity to have those bird in hand, birds in hand. And I look back at my photos now and I'd be embarrassed to put most of them in a talk like this because I didn't do a good job documenting them. Um, so whether that means you're in a role like I was or am where you do have the privilege and opportunity to handle birds uh, as a bander, um, or, you know, maybe you work at a rehab facility or something like that would just be to work on trying to get better documentation and, and proper documentation of the birds versus just taking a quick, quick photo of them in a bad hold where you can't really gain any valuable info from that opportunity. Um, that, that's, in my opinion, what your responsibility is and, and something that you could do to help. Um, more and more these days, people are also uploading images like those in, in the ones I've shown here to resources like eBird, Macaulay Library. Um, so you can actually upload images and, and click on uh, the metadata where it will say in hand. So you can now go in and you can search, give me sharp shin, hand, sharp shin hawk in hand photos. Um, and then you can see those. And, and that could be useful information for somebody that's doing a study on sharp shin hawk, for example. So that'd be my recommendation. Great. And I see one last question that's come in. So um, we're going to get really in the weeds for a second, Jesse, if you'll, you'll let us. Um, and this is about aging markers for golden eagles. Okay. So um, Connor's asking um, about the, the molt and he said that he's heard that it's more of one slow molt over time instead of an annual molt. Um, so, you know, was looking for some clarification there and then what those main aging markers were for golden eagles. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say that's generally probably not true. Um, you would expect the same molt sequence and molt centers um, for Accipitridae. 
if, if you've got an eagle, like especially in its first molt, it should start at P1, S5, S13, S1, um, and follow that same sequence. It is fair to say because they are larger and especially a lot of golden eagles, at least in the Northern hemisphere coming from really far North that their molt, their rate of molt, um, they're not gonna replace as many feathers in their second pre-basic molt and beyond. And so because of that, you may see a lot more retained feathers. Uh, but if you, if you remember, I mentioned aging adult or aging golden eagles. They're tricky because they have a subadult plumage. They take so long to get into their adult plumage, um, but it's best to use golden eagles tails as a method to age them. And we have a pretty extensive section on that in the in-hand guide. Um, again, knowing that there's variation between the ages um, and then bald eagles, you, you really need to have good images of wings spread um, to, to age them. And so that, that would be my recommendation. And I, so I would say like, it's not just one, one big long molt or anything. It's, it's maybe slower generally, uh, but there are some expected places that the molt's gonna begin and continue from. Great, well, I hope that answered your question, Connor. And I hope that everyone who had a question uh, was able to get it answered. If you weren't, you can send us an email at hwi at hawkwatch.org. Um, but thank you again for joining us tonight. We have a few more weeks of celebrating. Um, we'll be joining you next Tuesday at 12 Mountain with a presentation about uh, our raptor biologists that are currently counting on mountaintops across the Western US. And next Thursday, we have raptor trivia. And if you're not signed up for that, there's over $1,000 in prizes for the first place team. So um, hope you'll join us for that. Visit hawkwatch.org slash 35 years for more details or to make your gift since it'll be matched through November 3rd. Thanks again, y'all. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody.